Good evening and welcome to tonight's <coughs> regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. Um, if you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance as we start our meeting. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And with that, I'd ask the Secretary to call the roll. Gladly. Uh, President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Baker. Here. Secretary Kaminsky, myself here. <coughs> Treasurer Brandstant. Here. Member Gordon. Here. Member McFarland. Here. And Member Singer. Here. 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 And welcome to your second meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, you see in front of you our consent agenda uh, for the evening. Um, you will see the minutes from last week's approval. Uh, the uh, advisory board on instruction, sex ed, and birth control committee member recommendations, uh, purchase order for 18,000 and some dollars uh, for projectors to replace failing classroom projectors across the district. Uh, some resignations are listed, uh, approval of the payment of school systems bills for the month of September. And I believe that, and, and that's, I believe that's it. If there's any additions, or subtractions wish to be made? See none, I'll accept a motion for the consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda, items 2.1 through 2.6. Got a motion by Treasurer Branson and support by Member Gordon. Uh, any discussion? I have one comment and one question. Um, thank you to everybody, the parents, health professionals, and others that serve on the, the committee. Um, that, that's uh, very much appreciated. And then on item 2.3, did have a question with some of our closed buildings. Are we, have we really looked at all the projectors that we have throughout the buildings? Have we sort of made use of what, <coughs> you, know, you know, sort of uh, pirating and taking and using parts and things like that for the projectors? And I realize they do have a short lifespan because of the heat and everything else, yeah. but um, have we kind of burned through some of those extras in the closed buildings? We have, and I'll let Mr. Verlindi uh, speak to that. Yes, uh, with the elementary <coughs> consolidation, we had taken a lot of those projectors out of the uh, schools uh, and moved them into the regular replacement cycle over the past couple of years. As far as central goes, we have a few that are still on that main floor where we're still doing the meeting rooms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But uh, just, uh, a lot of the second floor, we have taken those uh, Proximas, I believe they are, um, and recycle those if they're not too old. But secondly, pulling the bulbs on them. The replacement bulbs on this set of projectors is uh, $300 per. Mm -hmm. So we've replaced those, and actually the new ones will uh, have a five-year warranty. The others were out of warranty, and the replacement bulbs are $90 as opposed. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have exhausted all our uh, leftover resources from that consolidation, and now we're moving into some of the oldest some of the first purchases uh, and replacing those. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All in approval of the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, we'll now move into request to address the board. We have no formal request this evening, but anyone is free to come to the podium if they wish. If you do, please state your name, address, and school attendance area, and limit your comments to five minutes, please. Seeing none, we we'll move on to Board of Education matters and the presentations of the board, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Carroll. We're going to do our Shining Star Employees of the Month first, and our first one is Denise Carson. If Denise would come up. While she's coming up, I'll read the wonderful things that people had to say about Denise so, and embarrass her. Denise began her employment with Midland Public Schools in 2010 as a paraprofessional at Adams Elementary. Denise attended Central Michigan University. Denise's paraprofessional assignments have included working with special needs student as a classroom paraprofessional, lunchroom and playground supervisor, assisting with classroom overloads, and more. Denise has an outstanding work, work ethic and approaches each of her assignments with a positive attitude and a willingness to take on new challenges. She makes a positive difference in the lives of Adams students and staff. Denise was nominated for the Shining Star Award by Adam's parent. Among his comments, the parent wrote, Denise Carson is everything a parent could ask for in a person who works with their child. She is an excellent communicator with home on how our, how our child's day was at school. 
handwritten notes about what happened at the school that day are so very helpful to us at home. If she didn't take the time to write those notes to us, we would not be able to reinforce the behaviors that we want to see. Denise is very nurturing. She is understanding and tolerant of our child's behavior. I could tell very early on that Denise genuinely cares for our, ch our child. She is a, st a shining star. So you fit that very well. Congratulations. You get to go and shake everybody's hand here. Oh, okay. and, I, and let me forget your gift here. Oh, thank you okay. very much. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Congratulations. And our second shining star is Bill Monroe. And this is what people had to say about Bill. Bill began his career with Midland Public Schools on August 26, 1991. Should I say all that? Oh, well, it's okay. <laughs> As, a, <laughs> As a member of the music staff with the elementary band program and the Midland High School Wind Ensemble and Marching Band, 22 years later, Mr. Monroe continues to work with elementary and high school students helping them develop their love and appreciation of music and fine-tune their musical instruments and music theory skills. Mr. Monroe holds a bachelor's degree from Michigan State University in music education, theory and composition, and a master's degree in music education from North Texas State University. Before coming to Midland Public Schools, Bill taught music for nine years in Texas and in Battle Creek. Mr. Monroe is a member of the Michigan School Band and Orchestra Association, attends clinics and conventions sponsored by this organization annually. Mr. Monroe consistently takes the Midland High School students band, band students to music festivals to receive feedback from outside sources. Last year, the band was invited to play at Western Michigan University School of Music's 100th anniversary celebration. Mr. Monroe's band room is a place where students want to be, not only in class, but just to hang out and be part of something special. The amazing and varied performances by the approximate 180 member band continues to enhance the Chemic Pride experience from Midland High School students, staff, parents, alumni, and community year after year. Bill was nominated for the Shining Store Award by an MPS employee who also has a child in the Midland High Band. This employee parent wrote, last night at the end of the marching band practice, Mr. Moreau took the Midland High School marching band to a soldier's house, a former Midland High School band member who lives near the school to play the Star Spangled, Star -spangled Banner. The soldier is being deployed next week. What a great example to the band students, especially the day before 9-11. Congratulations to Bill. Thanks for what you do. Thank you. Yeah. We have two presentations, and the first one tonight is going to be with Mr. Lauer. I'll turn it over to Jeff. Good evening. Pleasure to be up in front of you talking about a group of people and a program that uh, I'm very proud of, and that is uh, our counseling program. And uh, perceptions, the counseling perceptions. Perceptions are an interesting phenomenon. Individuals perceive the world in terms of their expectations. Perceptions are not identical and uh, aren't based on necessarily the object itself, and they're different from person to person, depending on our experiences. Perceptions are affected by what is important to us, what is in the foreground as compared to what is in the background. The graphic on the screen is not animated, and yet some it appears to move. It's not a computer-generated thing. As it's Given there's a piece of paper in front of you so you can see it happen there as well. School counseling is not much different. It has dramatically changed, but when most of us consider the role, its background, I might say, uh, we hearken back to our own experiences uh, with our counselors. For some like me, that was quite some time ago. Many of us had little or no contact with our counselors, and counselors were viewed as necessary for students with maybe social-emotional issues that needed to be addressed, or those that needed help in career planning. Although these roles still exist, the purpose and focus is so much deeper, and the role has expanded significantly. So I'm here today to paint 
a new perception and share the movement that counseling has undergone. Now consider the foreground. The Midland Public Schools Counseling Program is focused on the success of all students. They provide programming to all students on coping skills and personal development. Counselors take the lead as advocates between students and teachers, parents and teachers, parents and students, families and community resources. By knowing their students, counselors can work with every member of the school and home team as needed to address whatever obstacles to success the student is facing. Counselors are also advocates for an effective school counseling program. Coordinating efforts of teachers, parents, support personnel, and community resources to promote counseling program objectives, they seek connections to community resources such as DHS, Yes Counselors, and the Rocks RU1 program. They look for ways to deliver the program in innovative and fiscally responsible ways. Recently, counselors have been making presentations to staff during professional development days on topics that build an understanding of the goals of the program and to create collaborations between counselors and building staff. They also use this time to promote counseling and guidance activities, pro uh, programs, uh, activities and programs, excuse me, to the school community to enhance a positive school climate. <coughs> As you are well aware, schools are graded on student performance on standardized testing in Michigan, and school improvement is a primary focus of all schools. What you may not be aware of is that counselors play a critical role in this process. So what is the perception of the counselor's role in student assessment based on uh, content knowledge assessments? Certainly the first thing to come to mind is that they are in charge of coordinating the assessment at the secondary level. They give the tests. They plan the tests. But there's so much more. In the counseling program, we have made significant progress in working with the school improvement data, identifying students who are not finding success, and adapting to their needs. Counselors are working with teachers, administrators, parents, and these students to identify the barriers that impact their performance. When you ask most teachers which behaviors most affect the success of students, the top behaviors you'll hear are attendance, work completion, and discipline. Counselors are working with these students to identify the reasons behind these behaviors, identifying the skills that need to be developed, and in collaboration with the teachers, with the parents, and with the administra administrators in the building, are putting plans in place for these students. Have you ever heard a student ask, why am I taking this course? I believe I asked that same question when I was a student. The Midland Public Schools Counseling Program works hard to help students identify their career pathway and make course selections that allow them to clarify their career development plans, and it helps them answer that question. We develop opportunities for career exploration and collaborate with community organizations and businesses such as the Midland Area Chamber of Commerce and Junior Achievement. We prepare students for their post-secondary experience, whether they are college-bound or looking at specialized training or the military. As part of the SVSU Gerstacker Fellowship, I began a project exploring a local college access network, which focuses on helping students, particularly first generation and at promise students, through the maze of dates and processes that students must navigate to get to college or post-secondary training. If any of you have gone through this with your child, you'll know exactly how complex that process can be. This led to an, uh, an opportunity to collaborate with Sharon Mortensen from the Midland Area Community Foundation, who has a passion in this area too. Since then, the educational and nonprofit community has come together to see how we can work together to increase the edu educational attainment of our students. The week of November 4th, the Midland Public Schools Counseling Department is hosting a related event called a College Application Week. The goal of this is for every senior to have completed at least one application to a college or post-secondary training program. Dow High School's event is November 6th, and Midland High's event is November 7th and 8th. We have volunteers from local colleges, financial advisors, scholarship program leaders, and post-secondary training facilities, all being part of this to help students get, big, get the whole picture. And this is through the work of our counseling program. We are also grateful to the senior English teachers at both schools, both high schools, who have been key in preparing students for this process even before College Application Week existed. 
through curriculum that develops application skills and essay writing that is often required as part of applications and scholarships. Now, the counseling program has faced many challenges in recent history that many of you are aware of. The elimination of elementary counseling, which has eliminated, eliminated coping skills development at, an early, at this early stage. A reduction in staff that has student to counselor ratios ranging from 420 to 1 up to 1,000 to 1. And a shift in emphasis from personal counseling to academic and career advising. Now, I mention these as a matter of fact, not as a complaint. We all know the circumstances of educational funding in Michigan right now. And although we are not able to deliver all that we might hope, we have taken this opportunity to develop a quality program that is beneficial to all students with a focus on those students that need our skills and training most. We are able to provide a quality career development program to all students in groups and have focused our small group and individual attention on those students that need that skill and that training of a counselor on a more focused basis. This focus, connected to school improvement processes, is intended to help break down the learning barriers of our building's struggling students and support the school improvement goals of each building. A developing concern, since counselors play a primary role in testing, is the impact of future testing plans by our state on our ability to maintain that quality program, which requires our specific skills, in balance with the needs for testing, which does not. We are fortunate to have a quality and qualified staff to take on these challenges and create opportunities. Whatever comes, you can rest assured that we will not let our students get lost in the mix. We will highlight their individual talents, skills, and aspirations. We have dedicated ourselves to the success of Midland Public School students and our mission, in partnership with our community, to prepare students as knowledgeable, self-reliant, cooperative, and ethical learners who are contributing citizens. And we thank you for the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Question. We'll move on to the next presentation, and we wanted to uh, recognize um, uh, Tracy here today for a uh, good job that the school has done being a, a reward school. And Tracy, I think, is going to explain that. I'll let her introduce the staff that she brought with her. There we go. To let you know about some of the great things happening at Chestnut Hill. Uh, as you may remember, uh, even though we tested at the 95th percentile on our MEEP scores, in August of 2012 we were designated a focus school for having too large of a gap between our highest achieving and our lowest achieving students is based on our MEEP scores. This, uh, this forced us to take an even deeper look at our test scores and the things that we were doing in our building. One of the first things that we did at Chestnut Hill uh, was a data dialogue, we being our school improvement team and our staff, looking even deeper at our test results within the specific academic areas and specifically those students who were in our bottom 30%. When we did take a look at that, we discovered there were no real similarities in the students themselves. Uh, on our bottom 30, we had boys, we had girls, we had students receiving special education services, students who didn't receive services. We had different ethnic backgrounds. Um, we had different socioeconomic backgrounds. There wasn't anything that could jump off the page and say, it's a math issue, or it's a language issue, or it's a girl issue, or a boy issue. So we really had our work cut out for us. Uh, we even had students on the bottom 30% who were proficient on MEEP in the reading area um, because we had some high scores. The second thing that we did is we signed up for the Superintendent's Challenge. This program focused on students who may have attendance, behavior, and or academic issues. Again, we were looking at our bottom 30%, selecting 8 to 10 students. Uh, we chose our 4th and 5th grade students and provided them each with a personal mentor that met daily with them to address their needs. Um, 
I do want to note that the students that we did select uh, were selected due to academic needs. Uh, we didn't have any truancy issues or any behavioral issues uh, to address at the time. They were each assigned a mentor, and the mentor covered academic, social, or behavioral concerns. And this was a great addition for these students in particular, as it gave them the crucial one-to-one -one time on a daily basis, rather than being able to have that just throughout the week with the teachers. As we continue looking at our bottom 30, uh, as I mentioned before, we couldn't find anything specific uh, amongst this group of students. So we talked about what we knew about these students in general and how they functioned at school. One thing that our team agreed on, our staff and school improvement team, um, was that they weren't behavioral issues, they weren't truancy issues. Academically, they appeared to do okay. Um, however, when the testing came around, wasn't as successful as we thought they should be. Uh, one of the things we learned about is that to us it appeared they just didn't have the connection to school that they, we thought that they needed to be successful. They were at school, they were behaving, um, they were doing some homework, maybe not all the time, but they just didn't have uh, the spark, I think is kind of what we were looking for to give them that great connection with school. And so we wanted to take a look at that a little bit further. And so Margaret's going to talk about the school connection and uh, what we discovered with these students, and it's pretty interesting because a lot of times when we look at our test results, we tend to focus in on one academic area, like I said, math, reading, writing. Uh, this time, the focus was on the students. Thank you, Tracy. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should just, oh, now I broke it. Cindy. Yeah. Cindy. This little TV can hear you. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> okay, am I good? Okay. Um, as Tracy mentioned, um, we looked at our bottom 30% of our students, and like she said, we couldn't find that easy answer. We couldn't say it was all girls, we couldn't say it was boys. Um, they didn't seem to have any common um, issue that we were looking for. So, we did what all you know good educators do. We go to what the research tells us and compare it to what we know. Um, we started and we looked at two different research areas. We looked at brain research and how kids learn, and then we also looked at that um, new research about how the community affects the child and how the environment in the classroom is so important. The brain research was easy. Um, it told us basically that a lot of times kids come to school and they have a perceived threat. Um, now keep in mind it's perceived. It may be real, it may not be real, but they feel threatened when they walk in that door. For elementary kids, we thought about a child coming in thinking, well, the teacher doesn't like me, or I don't have any friends in this class. School's always been hard for me. I don't know how to read. These are all those little things that go on in their minds that we think, well, that's silly, but it's real to them. Um, the RAIN research showed us that right away if a child comes in with that feeling, um, they shut down the, they shut down the part where they think, they shut down their cerebral cortex. They automatically go to a fight or flight defense. They think to themselves, they react with emotion. Um, and at that point, all learning has shut down for the teacher. No matter what you do, no matter how awesome you are in front of the class, there's no learning going in. That child is simply there to survive the day. Um, with that, it just showed us when we jumped into the next piece of research how important it is um, to have that learning community. Um, we know that not only do they come in with that fight or flight, we know that when they start that first day, they know who you are. And I think sometimes teachers forget this. They forget that most likely kids have had older siblings in the school. We forget that even parents in the community talk about teachers' reputations. Um, and they forget that they hear from other kids, you know, oh, Mrs. Doan, she's really crabby, watch out for her. We forget all that. Um, and when they walk in that first day, they're saying to us, we're going to give you one last chance. We're really going to let you show us. You know, is this going to make my year or is this going to break my year? Um, and so those first minutes of the day, those first hours of that first week, they're so essential to building that relationship and that sense of community. Um, researcher Dr. Kathy Hamilton um, 
has a statistic that 160,000 students stay home instead of going to school because of that threat they feel in the classroom. It's a huge number, and that can't happen. <laughs> so um, what we did is we went back after that. Like Tracy said, um, Amanda, Tracy, and I, we looked back at those kids in our 30%. And we did say, wow, you know, they do their homework most of the time. They're here most of the time. Things look pretty good. And then we started thinking about what we know about those specific kids. And we started thinking about the way teachers talk about them. And they're just kind of those middle of the road kids who, again, they don't have that spark. There was no one saying, oh my gosh, that kid loves this. You know, I can tell this about them. There was no connection there with the teachers or connection with the school. Um, and so we decided that that was where we needed to focus for school improvement. We needed to make sure that that community and that um, relationship between the teachers and the students and the students and each other was solid. Um, so um, after we figured that out, we obviously went right back to our staff at the next staff meeting and presented our findings. Um, we figured it was very important for our staff to buy in to make it an authentic use of time. We decided for the first week of school, a lot of the times, um, the upper grades will departmentalize, which means they'll teach social studies and then they'll send their kids off for math and then another teacher will do social studies or science. Um, and we decided, you know what, if our goal here is to make that child have that relationship with the teacher, you need to have the children all the time that first week at least to get to know them. So we said no departmentalizing that first week. Um, we implemented a lot of getting to know you activities with the parents and the students. Um, it was really important for us to bring that bridge home, too, so the parents were totally aware of what we were doing in this new strategy we were taking. Um, and then, like I said, we spent that whole entire first week with building relationships. Here are some activities, um, K-5, that we just did to kind of get that relationship going and get them knowing. Um, sending some things home, you know, tell us about your kindergartner. Let us know what they like to do outside of school. We want to know them as a person, not just as a student. Um, having the kids evaluate what they like to do and again looking at what they are as a person do they do anything outside of school do they go home and watch TV what are your favorite shows um, and again with the older grades having them fill out the information versus having them just circle so as a teacher um, I thought when Tracy presented this to us I thought oh I this is gonna be weird I don't want to do this I spent my whole summer you know taking classes and thinking how did the last year end? What can I do differently? Uh, writing workshop is something I work on in my brain every summer. I just can't quite get it the way I love it. So I think, how can I change it? So after three months of thinking about that, when I go into the classroom, I'm ready to jump in. I think to myself, we're going to try writing workshop this way. And I forget how they're just coming in. I forget they haven't been thinking about writing workshop all summer. Most <laughs> <of the time. laughs> Maybe. Um, and so as a teacher, it was really hard for me to just want to follow the rules and want to do this team building stuff. I felt like it was slowing me down. I thought to myself, I've got to tell these parents in November everything about their kid. How am I going to do that if I can't give them an assessment on day one? You know, how are these kids going to hit those report card things if I don't start teaching math? I've got so many lessons to get done. So I really had to take a step back. Um, and at times, I questioned it, and I thought, oh my gosh, we're really doing this? They're going to go crazy. We can't do this again. But in the middle of that year, I saw the payoff, and I saw the rewards. I saw these kids stepping up. I saw them trying challenges academically that I'd never seen in the past. I saw their reputation starting to change. Those quiet kids were kind of coming out of their shell more. They were taking um, emotional risks and social risks, <coughs> inviting other kids to play, joining in games that they knew maybe weren't their strongest point. Because we built that safe community, and they really felt like they could be themselves or come out and try new things. And that was what we wanted. Um, that year that we tried that, I had 27 little bodies in my room. It's a seven and eight year old, so imagine how that looks. <laughs> um, and the thing I think that made it the most valuable was that I did build that relationship with every single one of them. I could tell you right now about all those 27, you could pop a name up and I could tell you what those kids like to read, I could tell you what kind of reader they are, I could tell you what sports they play in the fall and what sports they play in the spring. I could tell you how many of them order hot lunch and how many get a lunch from home every single day. I could tell you their brothers' names, their sisters' names, and I could tell you everything about those kids because I spent that time building that relationship. And because of that, we truly believe that that's what those kids needed. They need someone to believe in them so that they can go further and they can achieve. And with that, I'll hand it right back to Tracy to talk a little bit more about the specifics. Don't touch it.
<laughs> and Margaret was right. Um, that was not only a hard task for her, but very hard for our fourth and fifth grade teachers who were departmentalizing and wanted to get going on Wednesday and switch science and math. And we kept saying, no, 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 research tells us we need to do this, we need to do this. And um, at the end of the week and into the beginning of next week, we still had teachers working on it saying, oh, I'm really glad we do that. That was a really good idea. And they had bought into it. And we think it provided a much more successful start for a lot of our students. Um, so we took a look, did our data dialogue, looked at our data, uh, enrolled in the superintendent's challenge, challenge. And then the last thing we did is take a look at our school improvement plan that we had put together uh, the spring before. And we took a look at that and the strategies in our plan and new strategies to implement. And Amanda's going to talk to you about those. Thank you, Tracy. Um, as Tracy said, we took a look at our school improvement plan from the year before. Um, and as we reviewed the students' math MEEP scores, we noticed that there was an indication that we need to, needed to focus on improving the students' skills in geometry, measurement, and fractions. Thank you, Tracy. Um, to accomplish this, we implemented a measurement and or geometry Monday and a fraction Friday each week in all classrooms from kindergarten through fifth grade. This strategy included teaching a mini lesson for about 10 to 15 minutes in the areas of measurement or geometry on Mondays and fractions on Fridays. The mini lessons were in addition to the regular math lesson being taught for the day. And we found that having a whole year to give students more experience with fraction, geometry, and measurement, at least weekly, in addition to teaching the measurement, geometry, and fraction units as a part of our math curriculum, was a benefit to all of their learning. On a measurement and geometry Monday, it looked different across the grade levels. At the kindergarten and first grade level, the activities were more teacher-led and the students worked together as a whole class. If you were in a first grade or kindergarten classroom for geometry or measurement Monday, you might see things like weighing apples and comparing their weights, measuring the lengths of different objects in the classroom using non-standard units and standard units, um, and identifying and sorting shapes. Even though some of the lessons about geometry, measurement, or fractions may not have been a grade level requirement, we found that having the exposure and the prior, building the prior knowledge for future grades to be a benefit to all of our younger learners. If you were in a fifth grade classroom on a geometry or measurement Monday, you would see students um, working probably more independently, um, working on things like finding the volume of a rectangular prism. Fraction Fridays also look different across the grade levels, with lessons in kindergarten and first grade being more of a whole group lesson. Something you might see would be showing halves and quarters with objects like apples, shapes, crackers, um, any kind of manipulative that we could get the children to work with and experience a hands-on way of learning. In upper elementary, the students were more independent as they learned about fractions. You might see them changing mixed numbers to an improper fraction or an improper fraction to a mixed number. Also, as we reviewed the students' MEEP scores in all content areas, we found that we needed to increase our instruction of and the students' exposure to more com comparing and contrasting strategies. As a staff, um, in some of our professional development time and staff meetings, we shared um, the compare and contrast strategies that we use in our own classrooms. Also, our learning coach and building principal also shared some compare and contrast strategies that they had learned about in other professional development venues. We also found that our students needed more exposure to informational text. So our PTO generously purchased and continues to purchase a subscription to Scholastic News or Time for Kids for each classroom. The teachers use these resources to expose our students to more informational text and give them more time and more experiences with using their comparing and contrasting strategies. As a staff, we also established a common vocabulary when instructing in all content areas. As you can see on this slide, there are some examples. Um, when we're teaching the class, um, we'll often use phrases like from the text or story or from the passage um, when questioning our students and talking about um, what we're learning. Um, and we also use words. Some examples would be to explain or evidence text support, proof, cite examples, and other, um, other examples that you see up here. Each teacher has a copy of this. And another thing that um, 
was established during the 2012-13 school year was a common intervention time that was scheduled for three days per week for the third through fifth grade classrooms. And during this time, the teachers would meet with students who are struggling in math or reading and give them that individualized instruction, either one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. This year, in the 2013-14 school year, there's a common intervention time five days a week for the third through fifth grades. And as a staff in school, we work diligently to implement the strategies that we've established to the benefit of all of our students. And Tracy will now discuss um, our designation from this October. A few weeks ago, uh, we were notified that we are no longer a focus school. Now we are a reward school. There are three types of reward schools, uh, beating the odds, these are schools whose achievement exceeds expectations or predictions based on the demographic characteristics of the schools and the students. Uh, high progress schools, these are schools that are showing significant improvement and sustaining this growth over several years. And high performing schools, these schools demonstrate high achievements on state assessments in all five core subjects, are high on improvement, and are closing the achievement gap. We are pleased to be identified as a high performing reward school. And on behalf of the Chestnut Hill Elementary students and staff, we would like to thank the Midland Public Schools Board of Education and Administration for supporting us as we continue to move forward in closing that gap and increasing our student achievement. There is our certificate. Wow. Don't thank us. Yeah. <laughs> Don't thank us. <laughs> I mean, thank you. Yeah, I think it's quite an accomplishment. They, they did it in the category that they achieved it in as well. You know, the beating the odds is nice for schools that haven't been performing, but they, they, you know, they've been high performing, and, and the, um, that category is quite impressive that they got it there. So. Well, I have a ton of comments and questions, but as oh, board I president, I'm going to defer to everybody else <laughs> first. <laughs> so, <laughs> go. <laughs> um, with, with the data that you found, it was interesting that you didn't find one specific thing, and I'm wondering, have you guys reached out to other schools that were focused schools and found similar things, or is there... I don't even know, does the state have something that they're collecting this kind of data on what schools are doing? Because I know it, it was quite a surprise. A lot of the schools that were designated as focused schools, like we wouldn't have thought, oh, that school, you know, like mm -hmm. Chestnut Hill, really? You know? well, so I think I'm that... wondering if there's a feedback loop. And then my second question is based on what you found, have you guys looked at like one step further? Because it looks like it's a lot of that interaction with some different, um, styles you know there's like the looping where the kids stay in the same class for maybe two years in a row something like that that if that's the thing that was so important have you looked into something like that is we maybe have that's something that would be good to do yes and mrs stone has um, really been on that looping trail and after <laughs> me for a couple years uh, yeah i don't know her to we didn't allow discuss her it before <laughs> <answer>. <laughs> to allow her to do that um, we have shared um, our findings with other focus schools um, and I think, like I said, the hardest thing for us to swallow was the fact that we had kids who were proficient on the MEEP show up on this bottom 30. And they're doing what's being asked of them, and, and they're proficient. And so that's why we kind of had to look away from the academic piece and see what else is there, what are we missing. And that's why we started to take a look at those connections. What was the time frame on this? Was that this school year? August uh, 2012, we were designated a focus school. Um, September of 2012 is when we implemented the connection piece for the first time and then our students again were tested October 2012 and then we just got word October 2013 that we were a reward school do I think all of this together together made us go boom boom from one to the other no but I think it surely helped yeah, so. The, 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 I'm impressed with the time frame too. I, I actually had the same question as uh, Mrs. Gorton. Um, and there's other schools in MPS that have similar ways to benefit. We're sharing this as far as, um, or plan to share with our um, uh, our CE days or um, PE days we call them. Um, is that is that kind of excitement uh, have potential in other schools? You think? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. It, yeah, I think so. Um, and what's interesting is that. Is it, did you have other programs to look at to cue into the rapport and having um, more or less looking at trying to, I have, have written down here as I was taking notes, uh, to know them as a person? Just would seem, 
you know, were you able to look at best practices of uh, other? We were, and the researcher that Margaret um, cited, Dr. Kathy Hamilton, we had the opportunity to listen to her speak at the Great Lakes Bay um, Institute over the summer. Okay. And wow. she kind of helped us a little bit when we were looking at, you know, what's up with these students? Why aren't they achieving a little bit more? And what could be there? And we started looking a little bit at her research and thinking about that talk, and that kind of moved us in this direction. Yeah, it's just really fabulous that you took an evidence-based approach looking at the study and the research, and we do that in healthcare all the time, and that really is, gives you the most solid, most productive, and that probably that strategic approach or the process that you use probably made your outcome so good because you look to that and uh, you guys, yeah, all, everybody in the school, you guys deserve a, really a lot of great recognition for that. So that's just awesome. When I heard the news, I was like, yeah, cool, we're making some progress. Well, I, would, I would say congratulations and thank you to all of you and then your families and your students. It, I mean, it takes that whole group. And uh, Pam and I just got back from the state conference. I think this would uh, warrant um, clinic material, right. don't you? One of those sessions, we heard sessions from all kinds of... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people shared such wonderful information, and, and this topic came up obviously numerous times, and, uh, and uh, so it might be something you could put in your bucket list of maybe uh, looking into so you could share all this great information. I think I missed your answer to one of Angela's questions. When you talked with folks from other focus schools, did you find them saying the same things? Did they find a lot of the same things that their students were proficient on the MEEP? Yes. Their bottom 30% or whatever? Within the They were public. finding the yes. same thing. Okay. I just think that it takes a lot of courage to try new creative solutions, and I, I'm admirable of uh, your teachers at the school who, even though they didn't think that that was the direction they should be going, they trusted in what they were hearing from the other teachers and they bought into it and everyone worked as a team and I think that says a lot about your school and about our teachers and principals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? My turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a little not confused, but just a little clarification for me. Um, you knew some of the older students, and that intuition insight, I'll call it for lack of other data, led you to that intuition insight of these kids maybe not as engaged or feeling threatened, etc. cetera. Um, but then you also talked about kindergartners and things. Yeah. Um, I can understand the intervention later. I don't under, and I, talk to me a little more about the upfront that it, it doesn't get there. I'm assuming that's what you're trying to do. Um, we wanted this to be also like a, a, a team. I mean, we're working as a whole school. So we did look in the beginning. I think we did start talking about any of these things just up or out, but then we thought, that's not fair. The need and all this doesn't fall just on the upper out. It falls on everybody. This is our school. Um, so to make it more common for the school, what we have to get used to doing this, we did it to Okay. Yeah. Interesting. To make that link to everyone to make it a little more clear. And lots of people talked about the leveraging. I assume we'll keep leveraging. I'll leave that to Mike, uh, to the other schools. Parental reaction, especially of the kids that have improved. Uh, are you sensing anything? Did they notice directly? Uh, well, and comments? they noticed the first week when kids didn't come home with homework that was math problems and vocabulary. When they came home with an all about me sheet or a sheet for the parents to fill out, they're, you know, we had had some questions. They weren't upset in any way just oh you're but doing nervous. this but two yeah. days three days four days in a row the same type of thing um, but they were very cooperative helped us out filled those things out got them returned to school it made a big difference and I know this is too collective of a comment or a question but what about those parents whose kids improved um, feedback to you guys at all from them As far as on the bottom 30 list that yes. we're talking about, that wasn't anything that was really a public list yep. that was put out there that here are the names on the bottom 30. <laughs> but, but did that parents, was something we worked with within the staff. Parents that you kind of knew, did you see a reaction from them for th that their uh, we child did for the was different, piece? that we're seeing different? Yes. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Okay. Um, and again, I was impressed how with lack of direct data, 
if you want to call it that. You know, no obvious solution to the puzzle. Um, what's interesting to me is it took your insight and intuition and knowledge of global research to put those two together when nothing pointed directly. So congratulations on that. That was a great find. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Hand it back to Mike. Uh, we are on to action item. Okay. Um, do you want to lead into this one sure. on the resolution? I can, yes. On enhancement? So last month we brought to you the information um, what the resolution was and um, so you had a chance to take a look at it and read through that. This month we're asking you to take action and this will put the um, issue in front of the voters in fe February, February 26, I believe, of 2014. Um, and this is a renewal of the enhancement millage. And I think part of what Jerry's pointing to is we originally had talked about maybe putting our 18 mil non-homestead renewal on that as well. But after talking to legal counsel um, and their recommendation and us taking a look at it, um, the timing of that one. There'll be time still to renew that one. And he was concerned about, uh, and Linda can jump in at any point if she wants, if I say something wrong here, but the Headley, what they call a Headley hedge, and that would be the possibility that um, inflation of, or the rate of property tax would go up so high during that period that we'd have to go and have a hedge on that as well. And we really don't want to have to try to go out and explain to people what a headlay hedge is, because I can't do it very well right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and therefore, um, we might confuse the issue so much that we would lose the enhancement hit millage renewal, which seems to be a common sense one, a renewal of a present millage that is much needed when we're already operating in deficit. And do you want to comment at all on the rest of the county? Uh, Bullet Creek, I saw on the Midland Daily News, uh, took action, must have been last week. And um, I saw an article in there where um, the superintendent did a very nice job explaining it to the voters and what they had done and purchased with that. And um, Linda, if you care to talk a little bit about that, the history of that, what the enhancement millage we've used it for. Wait till my light comes on. Uh, I believe last time when we went to the voters, we were very clear what it would and would not be used for. And each year in the budget, I do present a table that indicates what those purposes are. Uh, one was preserving class size. One was support for textbooks and curriculum development, uh, technology, school buses. Uh, let's see, did I say career uh, is the, the fifth one? Mm -hmm. Car uh, career, technical education, technology, buses, preserving class size. And the fifth one escapes uh, PD and, and textbooks. Uh, so more in the category of things other than people. The one exception to that would be the preserving class size. And we're, we're careful not to say lowering class size because no one wanted to promise something that they couldn't commit to. But it, it has allowed us to, to maintain at least reasonable class sizes. Um, this stage, I'll entertain a motion on the resolution, and uh, we'll get some discussion and read it. I move that we adopt the resolution. Moved by Member McFarland, support. support by Treasurer Brandstad. Um, I'll read the res have, uh, Secretary read the resolution, mm -hmm. and then we can have more dialogue. Absolutely. Uh, this is the resolution for regional enhancement millage. Midland Public Schools, Midland County, Michigan, the district. A regular meeting of the Board of Education of the District, the Board, was held in the Middle Public, Midland Public Schools boardroom on the 28th day of October 2013 at 7 o'clock in the evening. The meeting was called to order by Gerald Wasserman, the President. All members, all elected members of the Board of Education were present. Uh, there was none absent. The following preamble and resolution was offered by member, I think it was Brandstant, you? Uh, member McFarland, McFarland and seconded by Treasurer Branstad. Thank you very much and seconded by Member uh, Branstad. Uh, whereas Section 705 of the School Code of 1976 as amended authorizes a school district to request that the question of a regional enhancement property tax be submitted to the voters by the intermediate school district at a special election if the request is made by the constituent districts in their resolutions and Number two, this board determines that it is in the best interest of the district to place a regional enhancement millage renewal question before voters at the Tuesday, February 24, 2014 election 
in accordance with Section 705 of the School Code of 1976 as amended. Now, therefore, be it resolved that, number one, this district requests Midland Education Service District, Michigan, uh, to submit the question of regional enhancement property tax for 1.5 mills for five years, 2014 to 2018 inclusive, to the voters at a special election to be held in each of the constituent districts located within the Midland Education Service District on Tuesday, February 25th, 2014. Number two, the superintendent or superintendent's designee is hereby authorized to immediately deliver a certified copy of this resolution and its attachments to the Secretary of Board of Midland Education Service District on or before October 31st, 2013. Number three, a regional enhancement property tax question to be submitted to the voters is set forth on Exhibit A attached here to and is approved and incorporated herein by reference. Number four, all resolutions and part of resolutions insofar as they conflict with provisions of this resolution B and the same are hereby rescinded. <coughs> Thank we you. Vote. Now we can open up to discussion and question and we'll take a roll call vote when we're done. Any other questions or discussion? Just to reiterate that this is something we already have. This is yes. just a renewal. This is not an addition. Yep. This no is increase. Yep. Purely a renewal. Plan. Yeah, and before I vote, I'd like to thank the taxpayers for their past support in this. Um, it has um, been a big help against the trends in Lansing and our demographic trends. And without it, I hate to think where we would be at. And I hate to think about where we would be at without it going into the future. So uh, very much thank our, our voters in the whole county, uh, especially in Midland Public Schools uh, District for supporting this in the past and really hope you support in the future. And to Angela's point, it's a renewal. It's no additional taxes. It's what we've had on the books for several years now and just appreciate that past support. And I, I have one more comment. Uh, Mr. Shar, you said it well, it's just a renewal at a time of deficit spending for the district. And just in reading Mrs. Klein's comments about Bullet Creeks, how they have a wide range of ability, I think there's a lot of flexibility with the enhancement millage. It really allows us to keep that flexibility as we go forward a number of years forward with that. So that's another good ass attribute of this. It gives us some semblance of local control of our finances, even though it's not huge in proportion of the Lansing, quote unquote, Lansing money, it gives us some local control mm -hmm. okay. uh, versus being at the whims of, of Lansing. Okay. Any others? With that, we'll take a roll call vote. Gladly. President <coughs> Wasserman? Yes. Vice President Baker? Yes. Secretary Kaminsky, myself, yes. Treasurer Brandstant? Yes. Member Gordon? Yes. Member McFarland? Yes. And Member Singer? Yes. All yeses? 7 0. Thank you, and thank you in advance to our taxpayers. Uh, moving on, Mike. The Yellow Board Policy Manual, we're going to ask you to adopt that tonight. Um, as you know, you have been working with Neola since 2011 to update your legal compliance of all your policies. Um, we're to the point where we're ready to adopt the manual and then um, post that, have that the practicing manual in the district, and then begin to take it through the normal procedures, which would be, you know, cabinet, subcommittee of the board, and to finally to the board for changes or updates as we go forward. And I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of them as we, we put them in place and we begin to look at what we adopted in legal compliance to the actual practice out in the buildings. And so the rules part of the policies probably will be reviewed quite a bit by us in the upcoming months. And Mike, for, for the, the audience out there, can you explain what NEOLA is? It, 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 um, it really is a division or, or once was a division of the school boards association. Um, but now is, a, is one that the school board will direct you to that helps school districts write policies to be in compliance with law. Yeah. And, and your last points of one I wanted to emphasize to the board and everybody else is with school law being so, oh, I don't want to call it volatile, but exponential in increase in volume, uh, keeping up with that from a local policy manual is almost impossible. So having a, a um, policy manual based on ever-changing law from a authority that knows better than us is great and then we will localize and customize as Mike said to that point. And when we're done we hope to have this uh, soon in a searchable database on your website. Um, NEOLA I believe offers that and if they don't there's other parts that what do because it's a big document and it needs to be easier for people to look at our policies. Okay. Any other questions? 
Just to add this, uh, I believe our local policy manual is called How Midland Public Schools Work. Is that, that that's like a um, another piece to that? So that is not being changed at this point. Just your board policy manual. So okay. we have two pieces of that. And okay. again, if, if uh, Gary or Linda with the history here would like to jump in there, feel free to. Mm -hmm. Some of what we have is uh, HMSW now is uh, gets into a very specific detail, which would really be more administrative guidelines for implementation of policies. Um, and I think what Neil has done a good job of doing is number one, uh, taking a look at policies as strictly policies and then following up the next step is administrative guidelines. How do you implement the policies that the board is entrusted with passing? Um, as Mike uh, points out, things change so quickly and then you need to have that policy, many things you need to have policy. Some of the legislative changes that happened here uh, a couple falls ago uh, required policy immediately be written. Um, it was required by the law so that we could implement what it is that we were obligated to do, especially with layoff and recall and evaluations and those types of things. Um, a service like this, which is highly respected and has uh, uh, legal uh, expertise behind it can help us stay current with those and as changes come we can get regular updates because otherwise we could uh, be uh, having two people uh, trying to do all the research on this to keep it up to date when we can get the, the regular updates. Uh, there are a few policies that uh, may not appear in this uh, new version that are covered under HMSW and we're going to still need to update a few of those but we will do that as we go along. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks Gary. Yeah. Uh, accept the motion for uh, adapting the NEOLA board policy uh, manual. So moved. Support. Moved by Secretary Kaminsky, support by Treasurer Brandstadt. Um, we had all the questions first. <laughs> I apologize, we took that out of order. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you for your patience on reversing that order there. <coughs> we'll move on to curriculum instruction, and I guess I'll hand it over to Bob. I have uh, just two items for you tonight uh, being presented for the 28 day period of examination. They're related to one another, they're supplementary materials to be used in health and wellness in grades. Uh, 9 through 12, and it's the student booklet that would go there and the uh, teacher's manual that would go with that. Um, like always, it's available outside my office of curriculum instruction for review by anybody, and uh, we'll be back in 28 days to, to approve those. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Cooper? Seeing none, we'll move to finance. No. Hmm. Busy area this evening. We'll begin with gifts. Those that are for information only total $12,475.42. Siebert PTO is supported art supplies. A couple of anonymous donors, one to support beautification at Midland High, the other classroom supplies at Siebert. The Jefferson Parent Advisory Committee continues uh, support for Study Island. I, recognize this gift from past years, so this is what we call a recurring gift. They're kind enough to support it each year. Midland Kids First, uh, providing computers for the parent room at East Lawn. Uh, and the HH Dow High School Athletic Booster Club, providing support for medical supplies for the training office, and the hockey team, some ice time and equipment bags. In addition, we had three donors of musical instruments. Mr. Ken Bodner provided a trumpet and a trombone, Sue Baki, a violin, and Deborah Kaiser, a clarinet. And we're always grateful to get those in our music program. Two gifts do require your action. They total $13,573. Plymouth PTO is purchasing additional key card readers for doors. And the Midland Area Community Foundation provided support for the Northeastern Jefferson Middle Schools Challenge Day. I'll accept a motion on 6.2. I move we accept um, the donations in item 6.2. Support. Support. Uh, moved by Treasurer Spranstead, support by Vice President Baker. Uh, any question or comment on 6.2? I did have a quick question, uh, Linda. What is, can you refresh my memory on the challenge day? The, um, 
that as a program? Uh, that was a program. I Jefferson don't have a Davis. lot of details at the top of my head, but that was a program that Northeast and Jefferson did with their students. They used the facilities at Central, and they had a group of students there, students and staff, I think for the better part of a day. And I believe the challenge days took place back in September. So at this point, they are done, and Lori Pritchard was my com uh, contact on it, and she would be able to give you more details. Thanks. Yeah. Any other question or comment on 6.2? I will make a comment. Thank you to <laughs> all the donors above, including those in 6.2. Very generous, very generous. Okay, all in favor accepting 6.2, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, donors. Then we'll move on to 6.3. All right, a couple of big ticket items. This is the time when we renew our stop loss insurance. And back in November of 2000, when we moved from a traditional insurance plan to self-insurance, uh, we began to purchase stop loss insurance in order to cover claims that exceeded a particular amount. Uh, those that would be considered to be catastrophic on either an individual or an aggregate basis. Uh, as of last week, we had payments totaling almost $1.8 million on our stop loss. Uh, I think at this point we may be, if I were to add up all of the premiums over the years, we may have paid more premiums than we've received, but it's pretty close. It really has uh, been a good thing for us to have. Uh, each year we have our third party administrator do bids on our behalf and so this year bids were solicited by Key Benefits Administration and they had three responses including our current carrier. Uh, however, the low bid went to Munich Re and I had to look it up, that's really what they are called although <laughs> Re stands for reinsurance. And they are one of the world's leading reinsurers. And what I learned from their website is that they were the only one who didn't go under uh, when they insured the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. <laughs> a little bit of trivia there. Uh, anyway, you can see the rates. Uh, it is a slight increase from this current year. Uh, and we did talk internally about whether we should increase our deductible. Our specific deductible right now is $250,000, and we have increased that over time. Uh, in conversations with Connect Care and Key Benefits, they really don't recommend that we do that. Uh, although it would save us some premium money, they really weren't sure that it would save us in the long run. And once we do that, we would not be able to drop down to a lower deductible. So at least for the time being, we'll maintain our $250,000 deductible. Uh, so the proposed contract is $13.89 for the specific for single coverage, $32.72 for family coverage, and then the aggregate is $3.45 um, for any of the members, sing, uh, single family, et cetera. Uh, so the estimated cost based on our membership right now would be $221,197.92. The reason I say that's estimated is because it is paid on a monthly basis and it depends on the membership at that time. So at the time of bidding, the membership was 91 uh, single employees and 466 with family coverage. Okay. Take a motion on... Uh on on approving the purchase of the Munich Re <coughs> uh, cat, uh, stop loss insurance. So moved. moved by Member Gorton. Support. Support by Secretary Kaminsky. Any questions of Linda? This it's interesting, Linda. You made the comment that oh, I was one. I was doing the same math, and I but I didn't know the past premiums. And I'm sitting there. Going, I wonder how we paid out on this. And it's interesting. That it's pretty break even, but we get to sleep at night you know, against big claims. So that's that's worth it to, to all of us that we don't have that hanging over our heads. So, and Munich Re is very well known. I'm, I'm very familiar with Munich Re, so I have no sweat over that. Any other questions or comments? Move into a vote. All in support of 6.3, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Back right. to you. Uh, 
the next one you have in the form of a resolution. I want to give you a little bit of background on that. We originally thought that we might be entering into this agreement on November 1st, and we didn't want to wait until the board minutes had been approved at the meeting in November. So we had the attorney go ahead and put it in the form of a resolution. Uh, you're not going to have to read the entire resolution. I'll just I'll give you the highlights here. And really, the resolution is authorizing the superintendent to enter into the agreement. And our attorney has been working with the attorney from Lakeshore Natural Gas. Uh, as of today, we all have language that we can support. So I think we are ready to, to move forward and we'll probably sign it tomorrow. But here's, here's the background. Uh, we recently solicited bids from energy service providers to assist with the purchase of natural gas. We had been, for the last few years, purchasing on a fixed price contract through a statewide consortium of districts. And uh, in conversations with a number of other districts and other organizations, we concluded that it was probably to our advantage to not purchase that way, but to enter into what are called transportation agreements. And so we did solicit bids. There were six companies contacted, three provided responses. And we asked for bids for one year, two year fixed, as well as spot market pricing. So we recommend approval of the resolution authorizing the superintendent to enter into a contract with Lakeshore Energy Services, LLC of Troy, Michigan. They are a wholly owned subsidiary of Seminole Energy Services, LLC of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And locally, they are the provider of natural gas to MidMichigan Health which was very helpful to us in the development of our RFP because they had gone through this process uh, not too terribly long ago. And we did recently check with them to see what their experience was, were they still happy with it. And they have nothing but praise for their ag agreement with Lakeshore. Uh, so although the actual savings will depend on the commodity prices by moving to this type of purchase agreement, we do expect to save thousands of dollars just by changing our method of receiving natural gas, we know we're going to save over $11,000 per year. Uh, and that, that has nothing to do with the commodity prices. That's just the savings from a different methodology. Uh, we could optimistically probably have savings that might get into the six digits based on what we were paying prior and, and where prices are right now. But all of that, of course, as Mr. Wasserman knows, depends on what the market is doing on, on particular days. But uh, Lakeshore comes with good recommendations. They have a good track record. And we're optimistic that this will save us some money in our natural gas. So uh, we would request that you approve the resolution authorizing the superintendent to make agreements, make revisions to the agreement and addendum, which are already done, and to sign the contract with Lakeshore. Okay. Um, I'll take a motion on supporting the resolution. We won't read the resolution as per Linda. Um, any motion on the on support of the resolution? So I move we support the resolution. Moved by Treasurer Branset and seconded by Member Gordon. Um, any questions? Linda, I have a few. <laughs> um, I won't go. I won't run you through the ringer. <laughs> um, what blend are you anticipating on? long-term versus spot buying? Uh, we think, based on Lakeshore's recommendation, that it may vary and that uh, it will depend on time of year. We're allowed to dial it? Yes, we are. At what frequency? Uh, you know? As much, I think, on a monthly basis. Really? Yes. Okay. Uh, because we met with the Lakeshore rep uh, two weeks ago after we had the, the bid results. And he was talking about early on setting it at one level uh, at this time of year and then perhaps shifting it as we moved into winter or spring. Mm -hmm. So we're not locked in it. That was one of the things we liked about this. And can you, and what, I assume when you do a fixed contract for a period of years and it's fixed, can you do a portion of your volume is fixed and yes. a portion of the spot in a given time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Good. Any other questions? See none. Uh, hopefully, the fracking uh, uh, trend will continue for nice low gas. Um, that said, all in favor of 
guess it's uh, 6.4 and the resolution to authorize Mike to enter an agreement. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah, I <coughs> well, there we're going to human resources and Gary. We have uh, <coughs> oh, first we have the minutes from the HR study Sorry, committee. Lynn. Yep. The uh, human resources study committee met on Monday, October 14th. And uh, we covered several topics. The first was a legal update that Ms. Marches gave the committee on uh, a pending lawsuit. Second, a workman's compensation case that she informed the committee of. And thirdly, a manager study update. And Ms. Marches set, uh, shared a brief overview of the results from a recent manager study. And additional information will be shared with the committee once the district fully analyzed the study results. And lastly, uh, we were given a, the 2013-14 internal full-time equivalent staffing report, which was reviewed. And this document reflects the staffing levels for the current school year and the previous four school years. And over the course of the five-year period, the district has reduced staff from 832 FTE to 792.5 FTE, and the administrator FTE has fallen from 40 FTE to 33.20 FTE. And copies of these minutes are out in the hall, and our next meeting will be December 12th. Any questions or comments to Lynn? Seeing them, turn it to Gary. Yes, we have two staff members who have announced their retirement. Uh, Shelley Hart, school psychologist, special services, and that would be effective January 24th, 2014. And Paul Sanderson, office support at the Science Resources Center, and that would be effective December 31st, 2013. And we thank both of them uh, for their service to the district. Thank you, Gary. Uh, on the agenda, you'll see correspondence to and from the board, uh, our list of our future meetings, and that moves us into <coughs> study discussion <coughs> session and to um, cut our new member slack for a second meeting. I will start to my left, but never very far away. Okay. Um, I'd just like to congratulate again Denise and Bill, both of whom I think uh, left um, on a job well done, and, and we still have our Chestnut Hill uh, group here. And, um, Margaret, Amanda, and Tracy, thank you. It's, you guys have really done a remarkable job and, and kind of left a lot of us speechless up here uh, just wrapping our heads around uh, your tremendous amount of success. So again, congratulations to you, and I hope you disseminate that information and get everybody um, on board with what you're doing. Thank you. Um, that is all I had, Jerry. Okay. Angel. All right. Well, I don't have much more than that tonight. Congratulations to everyone. I do want to say... I really appreciate Mike bringing this to our board meetings now where we have people coming in to share because I'm just learning so much about the district and other schools that I haven't been involved in and I really appreciate everything that you guys did um, on that focus because that's been something my kids both between this year and last year are attending focus schools and so it's great to see what is going into figuring that out and how it, how it is not what you normally would think that it would be and thank you very much for the time that you put into that. Me already, okay. Um, also, congratulations to our Chestnut Hill folks, to the teachers, parents, administrators. Um, you guys really, uh, we've had examples of uh, novel um, systems and approaches at uh, East Lawn. That really is neat, and it's really great to see out of the talent and out of the professionals that we have in the district that we can be part of our own solutions to some of the challenges that come up as we have population shifts, demographic, socioeconomic challenges, and things like that. And it's, it's, uh, it's people that do it. It's not necessarily dollars. And it's great that we can approach and think about things differently. So you guys deserve a lot of credit. Um, and uh, I said uh, a few things about the enhancement millage. I'm definitely, I think it's an essential uh, for this, uh, this time of deficit spending for the district um, and the flexibility that, that provides us. So I'm glad that we have that going forward, and I, I'm, I'm encouraged that um, our public will support it. Um, and then also congratulations to Denise and, uh, and Bill. I, I like hearing uh, about everybody's backgrounds and things that they did, and there's, there's, there's so many of the teachers and paraprofessionals and, and, and uh, folks in the district, some of our, I think we've had some, uh, just a really broad uh, background. 
Um, and it's nice to put a face to the name and the background and all that. And it's really is a very personalized touch. So I think this is round two of our Shining Stars. Yes, that's great. Okay. Well, I was going to say the same thing. I really like that mm -hmm. edition of the Shining Stars because it does uh, give us the opportunity to meet people that we might not otherwise. So I like that a lot. And I have to say to the folks at Chestnut Hill, I am just absolutely amazed at what you did there and in such a short time and how you just figured that all out and just made such a difference there. I'm just, uh, congratulations to you. I really am amazed. And I have to say, once again, I am so uh, grateful that my daughters had the opportunity to be educated at Chestnut Hill and in the middle of public schools. Um, so thank you so much for everything you did there. That's amazing. I just can't really quite even, I can't uh, get past it, I guess, because I just think about that short time frame that you worked in and the huge difference that you made there. But anyway. Um, congratulations to you. And then the last thing I wanted to say is welcome to Pam. I wasn't here at the last board meeting, so um, welcome, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you, as well as I. Thank you. I mentioned, um, <coughs> excuse me, earlier that um, I had the privilege to attend the state school board conference for part of last week in, in Lansing, and, and it's been a while since I've attended the whole conference. I've, I've done some of the classes along the way, but um, it was just really uh, inspirational, reinvigorating, because public education takes so many negative hits. And it was such a positive week with so many um, great things being shared, either through the speakers. Uh, we had the, na the national school board president um, there. So all the way from the national level to, to local, and many, many um, local districts, their superintendents, principals, and that's why I mentioned what I did to you, sharing what great things are going on either in their district or information that they want to disseminate to help other districts. And uh, just a couple topics were community relations and engagement and customer service because it is so important. We want to, we want to retain our students and, um, and do all that we can for them. They talked about online and blended learning and whether we like it or not. That kind of learning is, is coming fast and furious at all of us. So it was interesting. And I am I'm the least techie person around, probably. But it was exciting to see what, what classrooms are doing and teachers are doing. And, um, and then, which, which piggybacks on, on what you talked about, Amanda and um, Margaret and Tracy, achievement in schools, whether it was at-risk schools, uh, community in, in schools, which was similar to our, our uh, East Lawn model. And testing, kind of like which, and uh, programs like you have uh, incorporated, and they also had student presentations there, which are always the best. So uh, we had an elementary school with robotics, a high school uh, string orchestra qu quartet, was, which was from Saginaw Heritage, which was kind of neat to see. And then Dewitt had a high school creativity group, and they're taking learning to a different level, uh, individualized um, interests and public speaking and just sharing topics that they're interested about and which impact them um, personally. And then, uh, and then uh, just all the other classes that uh, I took just to, to um, say re-inspire, educate. So it was great and I am very thankful that, uh, that the school district encourages us, us to do that because uh, some days it it gets a little tough. You know, you just hear so much negative, so it's nice to be around positive, positive people and, and seeing what we're doing for all children. What they did say is we all need to do a better job of sharing the great things we are doing, which we have done so well here tonight, because even though there are a lot of challenges out there, uh, even in the United States gets, um, the media sometimes is harsh on the U.S. and how we're performing, and we are doing great things. I mean, if you really look at the whole apples to apples and all that kind of comparison, we are doing great things. So just a pat on all of our backs that uh, we, we um, are continuing to move forward in the right way. And just a little plug for Mike and his Algonac yeah. School District. <laughs> we met uh, several of them were there, and it was nice to see them again because they were one of a number of... Um, Michigan schools that received the best awards for their high school mentoring program, which we had heard when we visited his district. But it was really nice to see them awarded and um, recognized with uh, numerous other school districts. 
And then on a little lighter note, um, good luck to Midland and Dow High football. And there are, I think there's a Midland Dow volleyball game this week. So there's a lot of sports that are winding up with their, their districts in uh, state competitions. And of course, uh, congratulations to Shining Stars, Denise and Bill. We always like to recognize our staff whenever we can because you do so many great things for our students and make the rest of us look good. And uh, I think that's it. Great. Um, as well, I went to the Michigan Association of School Boards uh, conference as well and, and really enjoyed hearing all the stories of what other districts are doing. And the thing that I came away uh, realizing, or I think I knew it when I went, but it just makes you very appreciative of what our principals and teachers are doing. And today I was in the parking lot over at Northeast and a little rocket hit the top of my car coming down. <laughs> and a whole, <laughs> whole line of kids are over um, in one of their projects outside having fun learning and and hands on and I just love the way that the teachers use creative opportunities to teach the kids and really engage them and and those are the kin kinds of programs that make a parent want to be a part of a district like this so I think uh, just programs over and over like that that we heard about but we know and we're surrounded with them here at this district uh, today I signed up for uh, the school messenger service so I texted my code in and I'm eager to get a text message to tell me when the first snow day is and I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> my kids will enjoy that as well um, I'm excited about uh, this week what has happened with Common Core and um, moving forward with the Common Core and interested to see you know how how that's all going to be implemented here and really across the state so that's all I have to add thank you um, at the risk of being very repetitious Wow <laughs> <laughs> and it's just amazing and, and my mm -hmm. takeaway on this was not only having the right process this is no white data right data look in the end it pointed you to knowledge of your students and that, that first-hand knowledge of your students. And as the world migrates to online learning opportunities, et cetera, at higher levels, maybe that's going to be appropriate. At these lower levels, it's great that you know, that our teachers know the kids and know what makes them tick. And that made all the difference. So thank you, not for what you did, but for knowing your kids in the first place. So thank you. Uh, Denise and Bill, who've left, uh, congratulations. I can speak firsthand for Bill and all the efforts he and uh, Steve Drees both put into our music programs at both high schools and it, they're not only amazing programs but the dedication to their craft is just stands out uh, amongst the state and I just congratulate them and Pam one word of advice publicly here for you as you have younger children um, I learned early in my career school board to very deftly make sure my daughter understood when there was a school day that I was responsible for it. <laughs> and when there wasn't a school day, Mike was responsible for it. <laughs> so you'll have to learn to be agile on that and see how long it takes them to figure that out. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> That's it, I'll turn it over to Mike. I was just gonna say, um, since you guys ran into the people from Elginac, glad they didn't talk about snow days because I got a reputation for not calling them very many. So hopefully <laughs> the <laughs> residents understand that part of it. And, and I'm certainly gonna pass on to Northeast that it's not very advisable to drop a rocket on the school board. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, as you know, we uh, have this Distinguished Service Award in the district, and we've presented three of the four. We have our fourth one um, this week, um, Friday of this week. Um, and please come out if you can. Um, um, we've seen a few of you at some of the presentations, and I think the, the people always appreciate that. So far, we've recognized Craig Northrop, Northeast Middle School Building Manager. Uh, Lori Kennemeyer, Midland High School Lead Administrative Assistant, and I'm probably going to not say Lynn's last name right. Someone help me out here. Lynn Hedusik, um, Woodcrest Elementary Paraprofessional. And so we'll do our fourth Friday. You won't know who that one is to Friday. So um, we, someone, Lynn, I think mentioned in the HR committee uh, notes uh, about a pending lawsuit, and that lawsuit has been dismissed, so that's a good thing. Um, we felt that would always would happen, and it has occurred at this point in time. Um, 
school messenger service. I mentioned that one. We're excited to get that one going uh, for everybody. And snow days will be the big first test, but that you know, there's many uh, other things we can do with that messenger service. So we're very um, excited and glad our technology department has brought that idea to us. So good job on them. I uh, wrote to you about HVAC controls, and so we, Mike uh, came over and presented to us a little bit about our control issues in the district and some of the inefficiencies we have at this time. And um, I think this fits in very well to our uh, upcoming topics, which I'm ho going to hope everyone has agreed at this point. Or I'd like to at least stabilize those dates if December uh, 2nd and 4th works for you guys. We begin to talk about our strategic plan and some of the issues in the district and come out with a plan for that piece. So. If you know, we get time, if, if those days don't work, let me know, but I haven't heard anything one way or the other from any of you. Um, wrote to you about concussion awareness, so the state is now requiring that we um, send a notice to all parents, um, PE classes, those type of activities, and we'll have to collect um, the notice back into the district, and we're ready to do that. I, I attached that notice to you that Mr. Lauer had provided and was heading that up for us. A district newsletter, I think I spoke last board meeting about that, so. It's due out in November. We're, be, we're getting that ready to go. Um, we've called it our schools, and it's going to be released to the public through an email link we do, like we do the weekly newsletter. Um, but we're, we're also going to post it on our website, use of Twitter, and that's part of the parent messenger system as well. We're going to release it on Twitter, and we're, uh, Midland Daily News is going to carry that. And I keep using insert. I don't know if that's the right word or not but it, um, it's going to be part of the paper and we're going to connect to the homes through, through that use. Great Lakes Bay Area Curriculum Consortium. Um, Bob and I were invited to attend a meeting between those partners who have been doing that for a while and that's our ESA, the Midland ESA. Barry Aranac and Saginaw ISDs have been doing this. Um, we weren't really sure what we were going to but it turned out to be I think a pretty good meeting where um, the discussion was simply did we think we could add value to that group. And so I don't know if anyone's decided if we can or can at this point in time, um, but we were certainly open to the discussion going forward uh, with the whole consolidation of services and pieces in there, as well as um, as we get all cut resources, can we provide resources to each other to continue to provide good curriculum and instruction to, to our students. The International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, as you know, there's testing fees involved there. I believe last spring uh, Mr. Ellinger asked a study committee to go forward and look at how we're going to sustain those costs um, once the, the grant funding is, is depleted. They're not depleted yet, but we're trying to get ahead of that trend and look how we're going to cover some of those costs. Um, they've made a recommendation to us at this point in time. We have some concerns about it, but we're trying to still work the plan through. Obviously some of those costs are going to have to get shifted towards the parents and the students once grants are gone. Um, we're trying to soften that blow a little bit and most recently we've um, and I believe it's this week or the beginning of next week that um, we're going to meet with a possible source can help us spread that day off where we have to spread, send those costs to the parents and so um, we'll see if that comes to fruition or not but we're moving forward with that piece as well. And my last one is again the strategic planning session December 2nd through the 4th. Please remember those dates. That's all I have. Any questions for Mike? Anything else for the good of the order? Seeing none, we'll stand adjourned. Mm -hmm.